Well, good morning. We are continuing our studies in 2 Timothy. We're in chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 through 13 this morning. 2 Timothy 2, and I'll read beginning with verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. <clears throat> it is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, what a privilege it is to be here on a Sunday morning with your people and doing what we've just done and what we will do, reading scripture, singing hymns of praise to you and considering our text at some length. And what a great passage it is, what a great truth it gives to us. You are faithful. When we're not, you are. You can't deny your nature. You can't contradict yourself. And you are faithful to the end. You are faithful for all eternity. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bless us with the truth that Paul gave to Timothy and bless us in the same way. Timothy was discouraged and he needed to be encouraged. And Paul gives him great truth to encourage him, the truth of your grace and we pray, Lord, that you would encourage each one of us. Some, no doubt, are facing difficulties in life, uh, not spiritual difficulties, physical difficulties. You know our condition better than we know it. And there's a purpose in it for each one of us. It may be the pleasant things of life that we are enjoying at the present time, the, the health that we enjoy, our finances are in order, life is in order, all is good. And that's a gift from you for a reason. It's easy to drift when times are good. Keep us from doing that. Make us thankful for the good things you've given us. But those who are not experiencing that, who have difficulty, maybe financial or health, you, all kinds of difficulties. Uh, encourage them, strengthen them. May this passage be a help in that way. So we thank you for this, and thank you for our time together, and thank you for this great text of Scripture. Uh, we can read it, I can preach it, but ultimately the ministry is that of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity who must open our hearts to receive it, to understand it, to make the proper applications. And we pray for all of that, Lord. May the Spirit of God attend this ministry, this hour, with us. May we not quench the Spirit in any way. May we be receptive to Him. May He teach us and build us up in the faith. May we be edified by the things we've read and what we will study. And um, may you be glorified in it. We know this, your word, when it goes out, doesn't return void, and it will have its good effect. We have that confidence, and so we enter into this third service with uh, the hope that uh, you will build us up in the faith, and in doing that, bring great honor to your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray, amen.
George Orwell's novel, 1984, which was published first 70 years ago yesterday. It's one of the best known books of the 20th century. It's scary. It's about Big Brother and state oppression. But when it came around, it wasn't a bad year. It was an election year. Ronald Reagan was up for re-election. He didn't campaign on dire warnings, but adopted a positive message with a political ad declaring, it's morning again in America. It was full of sunshine and images of people going to work, calm and optimistic. It was a confident, hopeful message. And it worked. That's Paul's message. Warnings are necessary, and Paul gives them, but his message was good news, grace. That's what moves people best. And Paul gave it because it's true. He was living in dark times, but even in his dreary Roman jail, it was mourning for him. It is for Christians wherever we are in the world because we live now with Christ and we will reign with him. That's Paul's message to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. Timothy was in a spiritual war. He was worn down. He needed a lift. That's really why Paul wrote this second epistle to him. Paul has told him to kindle afresh his gift and to guard the gospel. And he told him how to do that with examples from the dedication of a soldier, the discipline of an athlete, and the reward of the hardworking farmer. Do these things, Paul is saying. There's great reward in it. Well, now in verse 8, Paul speaks of Christ, not so much to tell Timothy how to serve him, how to serve the Lord, as to tell him why we serve. And Christ is the supreme inspiration for that. Christ is the supreme inspiration for the Christian life. He is our Lord, but he is not a tyrant. He sacrificed himself for us, and he will never fail us. Even when we are faithless, Paul says, he remains faithful. Now that inspires devotion, and it spurs action. And so the first thing Paul tells Timothy is, remember him. What he was to remember is, Jesus Christ is alive and sovereign. He is risen from the dead, and he is the descendant of David. Those two descriptions correspond to the Lord's two names. Jesus is his birth name. It relates to his humanity. And Christ relates to his royalty. The Greek word, as you know, for Messiah. Paul says that both facts are according to my gospel and are really the essence of the gospel. That statement, Jesus Christ is risen, is biblical shorthand for Christ was born, he died, he was raised from the dead, he has ascended into heaven. All of that is implied in the phrase risen from the dead. Now emphasis is put on the resurrection because it is the historical proof of the gospel. It is the evidence that Christ's death as a sacrifice for our sins has been accepted by the Father. Our sins are all paid for. And we have forgiveness. We have forgiveness now. The, the resurrection was the announcement of victory over sin and death. And it is the proof that we have a living Savior. We are joined to Him through faith. And the life we live in the present is resurrection life. I often speak of this, and I often tell you I speak of this, that the Christian life is a supernatural life. It's not a natural life. We have resurrection life, life with power to resist sin and to obey God and be faithful now in this world. 
Paul will say that later in verse 11. But here, this gives us hope for the future because Christ's resurrection is the guarantee of our bodily resurrection. We have a glorious future which is absolutely certain. That glorious future is indicated in the second fact that Timothy was to remember, that Jesus Christ is the descendant of David. He is the Messiah. He's the King of Israel. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, God made a covenant with David in which he promised him that he would have a descendant whose throne and kingdom God would establish forever. Christ is that descendant. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. He is presently seated at the Father's right hand, and He will come again and establish His kingdom on the earth. He said at the end of the book of Revelation in chapter 21 and verse 12 that He is coming quickly. Now He said that 2,000 years ago. How much sooner is it now for us? We should be looking for that. He's coming quickly, and he says his reward is with him to give to the faithful. So Christians live between the two comings. We are forgiven now and will be glorified then. So while we are presently in a spiritual warfare, and never forget that, we are presently in a spiritual warfare. You're in it right now. There are influences working on you at this moment. We live in a constant spiritual warfare, fighting either the, the world or the flesh or the devil, but it's always there and we're always in it. Nevertheless, we should live with confidence and boldness because of all that Christ has done, all that He is doing, and all that He will certainly yet do. Timothy was to remember all of that. Remember Jesus Christ, Paul said. There is not a more important command or word for an earnest and successful Christian life than that. Remember. You read through the Old Testament and you will see all through this word, remember. Israel's feast days were all designed to teach them to remember the Sabbath. The weekly observance of the Sabbath was to teach them to remember. They were to remember on the Sabbath that they had been slaves in Egypt and, and God had redeemed them, brought them out by a mighty hand, continually be remembering of that. And as you read through it, you, you, you'll recognize that Israel's great failures were always because they forgot. That was the great danger. Don't forget. Remember. And when they forgot, then they fell into all kinds of sin and judgment that came. Uh, they didn't remember that the Lord is who He is, and they didn't remember what the Lord had done. They didn't remember that He is absolutely sovereign, gracious, and sufficient for everything. And as a result of that, they would drift into unbelief. They needed to remember. We need to remember. That's what Paul is telling Timothy do, to do. And, and by extension, he's telling us to be people who remember. It, it, it's not a hard command that he gives to Timothy here. He didn't berate Timothy for his failure. He didn't say, now get back into action. He didn't take a, a strong arm approach with him at all. He simply told him to remember. But when he did that, what he would do in remembering would be to recall the Lord's greatness, recall his love and his sacrifice for him and the hope of glory that had been given to him and to all of us who put our faith in Christ and he would, he would bless him in that way. It would lift him up. It would move him to serve, even to suffer along with Paul. And that, of course, is what Paul has been encouraging Timothy to do, to suffer with me in this great ministry. It's what Paul did, and he did it gladly. He writes of that in verse 9, that uh, for the gospel I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. 
and he suffered severely. This second imprisonment during Nero's persecution of the church was much more difficult than his first imprisonment when he was under house arrest. And I think that's indicated in this word criminal, which is a word that's used of men in Luke chapter 23, those who were crucified with Christ, the men who were men of violence, they were thieves, they were murderers, they deserved the retribution they were getting. And, and then one of the thieves, you remember, Recognize that. We deserve what we're getting. Well, that was the stigma that was attached to the Apostle Paul during this imprisonment. He was considered a criminal, and, and that must have affected many of those in Asia Minor who had defected from him, who were ashamed of him, and even those in Rome. He's suffering as a criminal. So his circumstances were humiliating, and no doubt they were debilitating physically as well. They were hard circumstances he was in. But in that situation, he witnessed something spectacular. He witnessed the supernatural. He saw the, the power of God, because while he was in chains, while he was confined, the Word of God was not confined. That's what he says. It's not in prison. The power that raised Christ from the dead, is at work in his people. It's at work in your life, in my life. It is in work, at, at work in our lives and in our circumstances so that nothing can stop God's work from going forward. Not even an emperor's chains. Paul had seen that before in his first imprisonment. He wrote about that when he wrote the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1. Verses 12 through 14, he speaks of his circumstances, and he said that they had turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Now, that's quite a statement in itself. The great evangelist, the apostle Paul, the great missionary of the church, is confined in prison, and that has worked, he says, to the greater progress of the gospel. Even when the messenger is confined, the gospel goes forward because he said his imprisonment gave other Christians, those out in the city of Rome, courage to speak so that the gospel spread throughout the capital. And from his own cell, it went throughout the whole Praetorian Guard, even, he said at the end of the book, into Caesar's household. Now that's quite amazing. That's the power of the Word of God. So Paul's situation was not discouraging, not to him. It was exhilarating. It gave him opportunity to see God do amazing things, and that motivated him to minister. He says in verse 10, For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. The fact that God's word is unchained and that God has his elect ones in the world gave Paul the, the courage to endure all that he was enduring, even these very difficult, hard circumstances. It, it is encouraging. It is to see this, this message that we believe and that we proclaim, uh, see it alive and powerful and, and see that nothing really can stop it. That gave Paul incentive to suffer hardship for the sake of the elect, meaning undergo all of the difficulties involved with getting the gospel to those whom God had chosen for salvation. Now, that must seem puzzling to some. I know that it does, this combination of election and evangelism. And I suppose that's true even here at Believer's Chapel, this bastion of Calvinism, this stronghold of the doctrines of sovereign grace there. No doubt some of you who've been here for a while that still struggle a bit with this doctrine of election and then to put it together with evangelism, that seems like oil and water it doesn't fit. And so it's puzzling, I say, but shouldn't be. There's no conflict between the two. God's election of sinners to salvation is eternal and unconditional. It is not because of foreseen faith. 
It's because of his, of his own good pleasure. Because he loved them, he chose them. Now that guarantees the salvation of sinners who otherwise would not choose him. Left to ourselves, we wouldn't do that. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 11. There's none who understands and none who seeks for God. But the elect obtain that salvation by God's grace, due to his election, because of the sacrifice of Christ, and by means of the preaching of the gospel. I want to emphasize that. They are brought into the family of God by the preaching of the gospel and faith in it, and not apart from that. And so it is essential that Christians give the gospel. We, we can do that with great confidence, confidence that God's chosen ones are out there, and they will respond when they hear the good news. Now, they may not respond when they hear it from you, but you may be sowing seeds for the next time they hear it, they will respond, they will be drawn when they hear the message of the good news of the gospel. Now, that is an incentive to do the work of evangelism and suffer hardship for it. We know, ultimately, that our efforts will not be in vain. Now, you may not be an evangelist. It may not be your spiritual gift. There are people that have that that natural ability. It's the gift that God has given them. But we're all to be able to give a defense for the hope that's in us. And we all need to know the gospel. Not all of you are, are, are teachers. You don't have that gift. But you're all to teach. If you're parents, you're to teach your children. You're to know the word of God. And when we go out into the world, we can have the confidence that when we give the gospel, it will never be given in vain. And so... Paul has given the example of the farmer, and that's a great example to give for the evangelist. The, far, the farmer goes out into his fields and he sows seed with confidence because he knows that the soil is good and that the soil will receive the seed and produce a crop. And so too, the evangelist, he goes out into the world, which does not look at all promising, it's the opposite. It's a world of unbelief. It's a world of rebellion. It's a world of darkness. But he goes out, nevertheless, with confidence because he knows that the elect are there. There is ground that has been prepared, and they will receive the gospel. That is how those who are chosen obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it, eternal glory. And so it's necessary that we be giving the gospel. Well, what if we fail to do that? Will the elect be lost? No. God will never lack a voice in this world. But even if, if we should refuse to speak and not carry out our responsibilities as men and women of God, even if we should refuse to speak, God still has the rocks. And if his people won't proclaim the gospel, then Jesus said, the stones will cry out. God's work cannot fail. He doesn't need us. But he has given us the great privilege of serving him and participating in the greatest work in the universe. And that is the work of being his witness. And Paul didn't want Timothy to miss the privilege and, and fail in the mission. And so he's been urging him to, to get busy like a good soldier and a hardworking farmer and do the work of ministry. Now, to add further incentive to doing that, Paul gives what he calls a trustworthy statement in verses 11 through 13 which is believed by some to have been an early Christian hymn. And so your version of the New Testament of 2 Timothy 2 may have it set out in that way. Mine in the New American Standard Bible has printed this out as a, a verses, of uh, stanzas of a hymn or a poem, a psalm. It may have been a means of catechism for uh, young believers, but... Many think it was a Christian hymn, and that's very likely. 
It has four stanzas. The first half of each one describes a Christian's experience or that of a professing Christian. The second half describes Christ's response. The first stanza is about conversion. The second is about perseverance. The third is about apostasy. And the fourth is about faithfulness. Paul begins, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. That's a shortened version of Romans chapter 6 and verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. The Christian life begins with death, begins with the death of the old self who was crucified with Christ. That's a great truth that we need to understand. Paul labors that in Romans chapter 6. We have died. You are not the man or woman you used to be. The old man has been crucified. He's dead. He's buried. And we still have sin within us. There are remnants of that old life, and we deal with that till the day we die. Paul talks about that in Romans 7, about the law of sin, this principle of sin within him, frustrates him. We have that. But you are not the old man. And Paul wants us to know that because we need to begin by realizing, I'm not that person, therefore I can't behave like that person. So the Christian life begins with death. At the cross, our, our death was sealed when Christ atoned for our sins and secured our salvation. Then at the moment of grace in regeneration and faith, that death is applied. We're united to Christ. We become spiritually alive in Him and dead to the old self and the old life. We are new creatures. So Paul says, we will also live with Him. Now that would seem to refer to the resurrection to come. We will also live with Him, and ultimately it does. But that life begins now. We're not waiting for eternal life. We're certainly waiting for the fullness of it, but we have it now. And because we have it now, we have this new life, which Paul speaks of as resurrection life in the book of Philippians. We have power over sin and the ability to obey the Lord. And that's Paul's meaning in Romans 6 and, and, and probably here as well. We have resurrection life now in the present. But the future is certainly in view in verse 12. If we endure we also will reign with Him. That's the goal of enduring to the end. And endurance is, is Paul's main concern in all of this. He wrote in verse 10, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. And, and that is our duty as Christians, to remain constant in faith and obedience, to persevere and thrive we have been raised to new life and we have been called to service that sometimes involves hardship and even suffering. But we are to do it patiently and faithfully. That is the path to glory. Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God, Paul said. And he said that in uh, Acts 14, verse 22 to the... Um, people who were very new converts there in Asia Minor. He'd been preaching and the pagans of the city took him outside the city and stoned him and left him for dead. And these new converts, these new disciples are probably wondering, what, what is this? This new life we've come into is, comes to this. And Paul gives them a heads up, as it were, gives them a warning. Don't be naive this is the Christian life. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So the Christian life is a demanding life. But the goal of it is glorious. It is the kingdom. And not just entering it, but being partners in it with Christ himself. He says, we will also reign with him. Now what a thought that is. Reigning is ruling. It is governing. It, it is active. And, and we will be active with Christ in ruling, engaged in things that really are too wonderful for us to even comprehend, in glory that is unimaginable. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, Paul speaks of the eternal weight of glory that we produce through our service in this life. In other words, nothing that you do, not one thing you do in obedience to the Lord, even in weak obedience, and nothing that we sacrifice or suffer in this life will go unrequited, will go unrewarded. Everything will be rewarded, and we are, he says, producing with our service and our life of faithfulness an eternal weight of glory. And he says that that glory is far beyond all comparison. We can't begin to compare it with anything that we know. It's unlike anything in our experience. It is so great that we cannot imagine what it is like. But we can know it will far outweigh anything and all that we might suffer for it. And that is strong incentive to endure. That is strong incentive to persevere to the end. And men of the true metal do that. Men with the true character do that. Not everyone is, though, and not everyone does. In times of persecution or even in times of prosperity, People sometimes come to the end of their profession. They come to the end of that declaration of faith in Christ and they disown Him. And so Paul writes, if we deny Him, He will also deny us. That's a real danger within the professing church, the danger of apostasy, turning away from the Lord. Clearly that is Paul's meaning here because he says that Christ will deny or disown such a person. It's the same as Christ's warning that uh, threatens eternal perdition in Matthew chapter 10, verse 33. Whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and soul and body in hell. Now, true believers can never apostatize. They persevere to the end, but one of the means that God uses us to keep us from apostasy is warnings. And you consider this warning, it is a sobering warning that those who profess faith can turn away and do. And it, it, it affects the genuine believer to make him or her not want to do that. It's sobering, as I say. God uses warnings to keep us persevering. He also uses encouragements. And Paul gives strong encouragement in verse 13 where he writes, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Now this is different from the previous verse. This is a promise not a warning. It's not about apostasy. Uh, that would be redundant. That would only repeat what Paul has already said. Th this is not about the future. It's not about the day of reckoning. It is in the present tense. It is about the way that Christ deals with us daily, the way He deals with us moment by moment, the way He's dealing with us now. When we are inconsistent in our affection for Him and, and our obedience fails, He is steadfast in His love for us. In fact, our waywardness only magnifies His constancy and faithfulness. We're all prone to forget. We are all prone to wander. None of us lives lives that are lived up to our profession of faith, not fully, even the best of us will confess we are unprofitable servants like those servants in Luke 17 did. Done everything you've said, but we are unprofitable. We've only done what we should do. Well, we so often don't even do what we should do, and that's the fact. And we fail, and sometimes we fail miserably. There's no better example of that than Peter who denied the Lord three times. He was a man of true faith. He loved the Lord. But at that moment, he appeared no different from the apostate Judas, who had disowned Christ for 30 pieces of silver. 
And yet Christ did not own, disown Peter. Peter had come to Christ. He'd come to him in genuine faith. And the Lord promises that the one who comes to him, he will certainly not cast out. Uh, the Lord is not indifferent toward our sin, of course. He makes us face it. He makes us repent of it. He dealt with Peter in that way. Sometimes he has to discipline us because of our sin. Nevertheless, he does not cast us off for it. And as he did with Peter, he restores us and he, rest he strengthens us. But why is that? Why, when we prove unfaithful, does he remain faithful? After all, we're not like that. We love loyalty and hate disloyalty. And we may want to make a person pay for his or her disloyalty. Christ is not like that. Why? Because he cannot deny himself. His relationship is not grounded on us. It's not dependent on us. It is rooted in himself and it's rooted in his grace which is his unconditional love. As Paul wrote in chapter, the first chapter in verse 9, our salvation and calling are not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which goes back into eternity. We didn't begin the relationship with God by our deeds, by anything we've done. He begins the relationship. So, it's not based on our deeds. It didn't begin by the things that we did, and so we can't end it by our deeds. God established it out of His own gracious nature, and He has promised never to end it. To break His covenant with us would be a violation of His nature. He'd cease to be God, and everything would cease to exist. That can't happen. He can't break His word. God cannot lie, and he cannot deny himself, just as he cannot lie. So we are secure forever, not because of ourselves, but because of God. He cannot be untrue to himself. Oh, but people will say, that can't be. That, that leads to abuse. That's only a, a, a license to sin if you think you are eternally secure. That, that is a dangerous doctrine. In fact, some have even put that in their creeds. It's presumptuous. But that's nonsense. First of all, sin is not an option for a Christian. There is no license to sin. You can read from Genesis to Revelation, nowhere are we encouraged to be sinful, or nowhere is sin treated with any indifference. Paul wrote in Romans 6 and verse 2 that we have died to sin, and therefore we cannot live in it. You're a new creature. Know that. Reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The bent of a believer's life is to holiness, not to sin. So... That's false on, on the face of it from the standpoint of, uh, of the scriptures, of what they teach. But the reasoning of it, the reasoning of that objection is wrong. God, God's grace produces gratitude, not ingratitude. It inspires obedience, not disobedience. When a person is forgiven a large debt, he doesn't want to take advantage of his benefactor. You say, well, yes, I can give you an example of that. Well, maybe you can, but that's an exception. And exceptions to the rule don't disprove them. They prove them because they are exceptions. No, the natural response to a, 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 the forgiveness of a large debt or any great blessing is to be humbled and thankful. And that's the believer's response to Christ, the genuine believer's response. I'd love to quote the Scot, Thomas Erskine, who I think put it very simply. In the New Testament... Religion is grace, and ethics is gratitude. We have everything that we have in the Christian life, the Christian faith, by the grace of God. And so our ethics, our, our behavior, our correct behavior is due to thanksgiving. It's due to a thankful heart. It's due, due to gratitude. Nothing inspires obedience and service like the grace of God. 
And so we will seek holiness. We will seek sanctification. And we will hate sin. And we will treat it just as Jude says, like a polluted garment. Still, we sin. Christians sin every day. And sometimes they continue in a state of sinfulness for a period of time. The Westminster Confession of Faith explains all of that clearly. It states that the perseverance of the saints depends not upon our own free will, but on God's free and unchangeable love, the intercession of Christ, and the abiding of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, through Satan's temptations or the temptations of the world or just the tendency we have at times to neglect the means of grace, the means of perseverance, the scriptures, prayer, the Lord's Supper, we can drift, we can fall into sin, fall into grievous sin for a time and continue therein, as the confession puts it. As a result, Christians can lose the assurance of salvation, not lose salvation, lose the assurance of salvation, but the confession states they are never utterly destitute of that seed of God and life of faith. And by the Spirit's work, they're restored. Samuel Rutherford, one of the authors of the Westminster Confession, wrote, Often and often I have in my folly torn up my copy of God's covenant with me, but blessed be his name, he keeps it in heaven safe, and he stands by it always. God never abandons us. And really, the perseverance of the saints is more accurately the perseverance of God with the saints or the preservation of the saints. And so Paul can say, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That's God's love, which is unconditional and would have made Timothy want to serve him. That's what the knowledge of God's grace does. And it's what truth does. When we get it, when we understand who Christ is and what he has done for us, obedience is natural. It's what we want to do. There's a familiar story that illustrates that fact. It's actually an ancient story. You've probably heard it about the north wind and the sun. It's one of Aesop's fables. Even the pagans could get some truth on things. Well, the two were arguing over who was stronger. And so the, the challenge was to make a traveler passing by take off his coat. The north wind tried first. It blew and blew. But the harder it blew, the tighter the traveler wrapped himself in his coat to keep warm. And then the sun had its opportunity, and it began to shine. And soon the traveler became warm and gladly took off his coat. And the moral of the story is persuasion is better than force. The truth, the Word of God, is a power that affects us. It sanctifies. Paul knew nothing would make Timothy want to put off his fear and put on courage and get active more than the warmth of Christ's love and the greatness of his purpose for his people. Christ laid down his life for us, the innocent for the guilty, so that we would be saved and made fit to reign with him in glory for all eternity. He walks with us now, and we will rule with him forever. Remember him. Paul said, remember Jesus Christ. Nothing is more helpful in the Christian life than thinking on who he is and what he has done, what he is presently doing for us, and what he will yet do for us. The best is yet to come. He has given us a new life, a clean life, and a glorious future forever. Is that your hope? If not, it can be. Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of all who believe in Him, regardless of who they are and what they've done. That's the teaching of the Bible. Paul told the Corinthians, 
Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised on the third day. And all who believe in him will be saved. And God help you to do that if you've not done that. And then help you to serve him faithfully. In fact, help all of us to do that. To serve him faithfully. Now, you may not know it, but for the believer, every day, regardless of your circumstances, every day is a bright morning, even under the clouds. May God encourage us with that. Why don't we stand and sing a hymn that I really love. It's in the white book, the songs of praise, song of Charles Wesley, hymn number 40, Arise My Soul. So all of you arise and then sing and remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 40. What a great truth it is, Father, that we call you Father, that we call you Abba, such a personal, intimate term. That we, who were unworthy, sinners from conception, were redeemed by the precious blood of your Son, made into new creatures. Five bleeding wounds plead for us daily, every moment, and we are kept safe as a result of what he's done and your grace. And we thank you for bringing us into your family. Bless us that we might serve you well with joy and even sacrifice, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.